I'm the general manager for the citrus and grape category at Costa. So uh, Costa Group is a, uh, 130 years old this year as a company uh, formed by a, a migrant family from Sicily and Geelong in 1888. Uh, went through multi-generation family ownership. Um, then uh, as it was growing and, and saw a need to, to uh, inject um, more capital and uh, opportunity for growth was constrained by the by the family operation, half of the business was sold into a private equity firm in the US, two and a half years later listed on the um, ASX and now two and a half years uh, down that journey or almost heading towards three years down that journey, that's been quite an experience. Um, we're a company that uh, we have five core product categories, citrus uh, category uh, which comprises both the citrus and grape products, avocado category, um, mushrooms and um, glasshouse tomatoes and berries, which is uh, all of the, the fruit bowl of the, of the berry category. So, you know, we're a business that has concentrated on our products, uh, has resisted the temptation, I guess, to, to uh, expand into products that we didn't believe could fit the criteria uh, for, for our uh, strategy. Um, and the citrus category is one that has been an absolute, um, not a surprise, but a, a very pleasant uh, experience, I guess, from a company point of view because it wasn't all that long ago as an industry. Uh, it, we saw, certainly you would have seen, no doubt, through press articles and, um, and the like, growers bulldozing out trees and, and uh, turning to each other and trying to decide what to do next when the dollar was over parity, water prices were through the roof, uh, market access was a major challenge, uh, and um, here we are only a short time later talking about how positive the experience is, or about to talk about that. So my key presentation themes today are to talk about um, how we as a company believe we're creating sustainable export markets, uh, how we learn from the past. So again, wasn't that long ago that we were really um, having a really hard look at the citrus product as a category and whether there was a sustainable future as a grower in Australia of it. Um, and not long before that, we went through a boom. Um, my topic is to talk about the boom that we're going through at the moment, to put it in, in numeric uh, terms. Farm gate values for citrus growers in the last five years have increased two to three times. Uh, with relatively, you know, uh, in, uh, inflation cost increases at, at, at the production level, so you could just imagine what level of enthusiasm and confidence that's uh, created in the industry. Um, how we can better connect to consumers to ensure we evolve from commodity suppliers to a genuine point of difference. So just a little bit about the industry. Um, it's 28,000 hectares grown nationally with a mix of juicing and packed citrus. About two thirds of it is grown for the pack market and we talk about packed and juice um, markets where certain varieties are only grown to be, um, ne never to be packed and sold into the fresh markets but to be um, sent to juicing uh, factories and end up in a, um, a fresh bottle of orange juice or the like. Um, circa 176,000 tonnes were exported last calendar year, which is a 20% increase on the year prior. This equates to $440 million in exports, and uh, Caroline showed some figures before around where citrus has moved from being the, the dominant uh, horticultural exporting um, product or category 13, 14 years ago to now being, you know, sharing that uh, um, position, uh, and I'm not quite sure we're third, but uh, we, uh, we're, we're sort of up there competing. Uh, grapes and citrus tend to be trying to uh, outdo each other every year, um, but well behind almonds, obviously. Uh, it's a 33% increase, so obviously uh, continuing to see greater value back to the, uh, the farm gate as a result. Uh, and this represents a 55% increase on export volumes over the last three years. The free trade agreements um, that got a lot of airtime this morning and also earlier, China, Korea and Japan particularly, have reduced tariffs uh, and have been a great um, uh, element in being able to further advance our position in those markets. Uh, and new and improved market access has increased our opportunity. So again, during the, um, the, the difficult years of uh, five, seven, eight years ago, um, China, we didn't have market access for, we do now. Vietnam, Thailand, the like. Um, so again, market access has played a really critical role in, in um, improving the opportunity for citrus growers and exporters. 
A little bit about the markets, I guess I'm going to provide a, a somewhat of a case study today about three core export markets, Japan, China and um, USA, and uh, attempted here to sort of show the size, of, it's not a Mickey Mouse impression, sort of show the size of the scale of uh, each market relative to each other. Um, the reason why I've, I've pulled these three out, they're all very relevant and we saw all the data earlier today around how important China is as a market um, and the growth of China. Japan, and I certainly agree with Caroline's point about it being a more mature market, um, but they actually function and we think about them differently. So we just don't think about Asia as, uh, as one region. We will, because uh, Japan and China, from a consumer um, behaviour, from culturally, uh, from a cultural point of view, from a retail, uh, from a distribution, supply chain, uh, the multiple layers of um, uh, sort of of distribution that product goes through in China relative to how Japan functions and the USA function are all quite different. And I think, um, therefore, how we in attempt to engage or do engage with consumers is, is different as a result. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of each of these markets, about 20% of Australia's export uh, oranges, so not all citrus, but oranges, uh, go to Japan. About 30% go to China. Uh, and about 4% of our total production goes to the USA. So how are we creating sustainable export markets? Um, maintenance and improvement of market access protocols is the solid foundation to industry success. It is absolutely the critical element. If the doors are not open, we can't do business. And as we've seen in the last few years with improved market access and uh, both new market access and improved market access, uh, that's been critical to the overall um, success. As a company, we can only do so much, we can only influence so much. That's the role of the industry and the government. And uh, I think, you know, citrus industry in Australia has done an ex exceptional job at um, positioning the citrus industry at the forefront in horticulture. Um, we have to have a point of difference, goes without saying. Um, if we don't, we're going to compete solely on price against our traditional southern hemisphere competitors. So we must find key differentiators, and they don't have to be um, significant differentiators. They can be at times very marginal, uh, whether it's timing, whether it's uh, the bricks content of the fruit, whether it is the composition, the aesthetic appeal of the fruit, whether it's our ability to mobilise quickly and be agile and uh, respond, uh, whether it's our ability to service the markets from customer relationship management point of view, um, and then working, I guess, with them on how they're growing their overall category. Um, consumers are becoming far more discerning better educated, and greater access to information allows for more informed decision making. Uh, high quality imported produce is a status item in Asian markets, and that's a fantastic position for us to be in as an industry, that the relevance that is put on high quality imported produce is so much greater than we as consumers in Australia place on it. Um, you know, and it's often equated to, uh, particularly in markets like Japan, um, the, the emphasis that we may put on consumer products in food such as cheese or wine uh, around the um, status symbol that comes with high quality and, and well-known brands. Um, it's, it's not too dissimilar in, in the produce um, sector. Uh, we have to look for innovation across all areas of the business. It's, it's a big statement, um, but again, it's often about the one percenters and not necessarily about a, um, a significant um, one-off. Uh, concentrating on building critical mass in core markets, uh, volume and season extension. I think uh, compared to where we were 10 years ago, uh, we now supply the Japanese market for 48 weeks of the year. Uh, 10 years ago, we would have been supplying them for about 22 weeks of the year. Um, so market presence, not trying to be everything to everybody, um, building on the markets you have. Um, we're the largest uh, citrus exporter in Australia. Uh, and there are markets that we have very small market share in because we don't have enough fruit for all markets. And rather than try and spread it everywhere and uh, you know, do, a, do a half job in, in lots of markets, we, we focus and concentrate heavily on the markets that we're really wanting to protect and build our position in. Um, brand and robust quality assurance consistency is key. Australia has a very good image, um, but so does um, Chile and Peru, they don't, they're not that far behind us in terms of the market research we've seen around the image of, and of consumers around the, the clean and green and you know, we, don't, we don't own that um, solely, that, that's shared with another, a lot of our competitors as well. Um, 
and we have to defend our market position. We operate in a competitive market. Um, we can't just rely on all of these things above. At the end of the day, uh, if we need to, um, if we want to uh, have a position in the market that creates sustainability for the future, you've got to be prepared to defend it. And your competitors will come after you and they will try and take it off you. Um, just to reflect a bit, learning from the past, um, if I look back 15, 20 years ago as an industry, how we operated uh, into these export markets, um, you know, the exporter and the importer wholesaler were not always aligned. The importer wholesaler, and still today, they're not always aligned. Um, so you have to have a relationship with that end user or, or that end uh, retailer who's engaging with the consumer. Um, we, we have a brand um, that we pack our product in and we uh, believe very strongly in our brand and we, uh, we, we understand all the core principles of what a brand is about, uh, but we don't have the scale, even as the biggest citrus exporter in Australia, we don't have the scale to, um, in all of the markets that we're in, to be able to um, have a B2C brand. So it is very much a B2B brand and it is about winning that engagement with the trade level. Um, and maybe in the future it will start to resonate through um, to the consumer level. But you need very deep pockets. There's some excellent examples in horticulture around the companies that are doing it very well. Um, Zespri, Driscoll's uh, in Asia and are really leading the way, but they have very deep pockets and they're investing a huge amount of resources into that space. Um, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a long game and it's a very expensive game. And um, some markets we do, in other markets we don't because we just don't have the critical mass to be able to justify um, so how do, you, how do you build the brand with a consumer or how do you build your product in the market with a consumer if you're not going to have a relationship around brand? Well, from our point of view, it's about you've got to have closer relationships with the end retailer. The, the, the uh, retailer that's engaging with the consumer who has the trust with the consumer. We heard today talking about whether it's the, the mum and pup shop who people shop at because they, they have confidence and faith and trust in that person to do the right job um, with the food safety or the product quality and they don't ask questions, they just repeat purchase, uh, whether it's that or whether it is the big mainstream retailer uh, where people are maybe folk shopping on the basis of convenience or it's about being able to shop the whole basket in, in one stop because they're time poor. Um, so we have to have a relationship with them and that's, that's our key point of engagement. Retailers now want more than commodities too. So they're, they're in a... Um, in a, in a very difficult um, space, whether it's in the export markets or in the domestic market in Australia, all trying to find their identity. How are they different from someone else? All want the edge and they want sometimes only a small edge. And if it just gives them something that they can go to market, um, your product, as in our product, can go to market and call out some character quality or um, some element that will give them a credible, genuine uh, point of difference in the market. Um, then we have to identify that and, and um, ensure we do that. Uh, we can't stop focusing on innovation. 15, 20 years ago as an industry, uh, growers were making a lot of money and they were reinvesting that money with putting more trees back in the ground, uh, but we weren't necessarily finding more innovative or cost-effective ways to grow it, uh, and we weren't protecting our markets against uh, the increased production that was coming from our Southern Hemisphere um, competitors. Uh, as I said before, brand's important and the whole produce industry is built off the back of brand. Um, but it is only limited to the trade level for the, for the vast majority of players. Um, and it's really difficult to reach consumers. And Ryan gave some really good examples, I think, of how they've been able to, from a direct marketing um, campaign, uh, reach those consumers. But that's very difficult to do on mass scale. Um, without having very deep pockets and um, significant critical mass. So, I've got three case studies, as I mentioned before, that I, that I guess want to focus on because, again, we look at these three markets um, and they're three of our bigger export markets for citrus. Uh, we look at them differently, we treat them differently, and there are different stages of, of um, development. Um, so China, we've only had market access into that market for a few years. Um, and that is, uh, that's where the growth is at the moment. There seems to be a, um, a demand far greater than supply can, than can, can meet um, and that is obviously propelling the industry. Um, but it's also not necessarily teaching us anything, right? Because we're all able to enjoy the fact that um, 
there's more demand than supply, the, you, you get a positive impact on your price, um, but how sustainable is it? At what point does it reach that equilibrium and we start to see price pressure? At what point do we now need to stop just focusing on fulfilling orders and actually uh, reaching the consumer and creating a sustainable position? Um, you know, we, uh, our strategy to date has been really focused on the highest grade and best quality. So we have resisted the temptation to uh, downgrade our quality of our product off the back of, of the demand. Um, we have to build a baseline position around our brand, um, quality, reliability and consistency. Because we don't know uh, yet. And China, in, in citrus certainly, in the produce, more broadly in produce, is a um, difficult market to, uh, you know, we have meetings with the Walmarts and the Tescos and, and Alibabas and the like, and, and, um, but having a meeting with them doesn't necessarily directly translate to that's how you're going to do business in the conventional way that we would do business with supermarkets around the world. There are multiple layers of distribution often, there is a very dominant terminal market model, um, and um, there doesn't seem to be uh, necessarily a desire to change that. And, um, so we have to make sure that we build our uh, value proposition around that quality, reliability and consistency. Quality is resonating with the consumers. So if we think about the brand Australia, Australian product consistently is the highest price in the market reports that we get back and in our own returns. Um, and it's, it's resonating. So the, um, whether it's a natural competitive advantage that we enjoy in Australia around the quality of the produce that we can um, uh, bring to the market there, um, or it's our cultural practices, or it's the standards of which we set, or it's a combination of all of those, uh, it's resonating in a market that is, seems to have this sort of unquestionable thirst for high quality produce. Um, but it, it's still a very immature stage, I guess is the key element how I look at this market compared to the other two that I'll talk about. It's at a very immature stage of that development. Um, the, um, the retail engagement, they're still very focused around supply um, fulfilment and um, putting the brand Australia on the shelf, not necessarily our brand or Ryan's brand or someone else's brand. It's uh, at the end of the day, it's all about us forming around brand Australia, and um, and um, that seems to be resonating very much with the consumers. Japan, um, we've been in that market now for about 15 years. Um, Australia, uh, or oh, sorry, firstly for China, I'd estimate, and the data is never all that. Um, isn't always that accurate, but we'd estimate that Australia is about 15 to 20% in the window that we're supplying of the oranges that China are importing and, and, are, and are selling. Um, if you look at Japan, it's about 67% of oranges on the shelf in the window that we supply are Australian oranges. That's a very high percentage market share Australia enjoys in Japan in the winter months that we're supplying into that market. Um, we, uh, so we get back before it started to talk about how we're connecting with consumers. So the feedback we get, the market research that are shared with us from the supermarkets that we deal with and the importers that we work with is that Australia is, uh, and it's, it's um, empirical data to support it, Australia's uh, BRICS content, sugar content uh, and acid levels are consistently higher bricks and lower acid than acid than our competing countries. And that's becoming, you know, consumers are becoming more discerning. They're no longer just looking for an orange, they're looking for a sweeter orange, they are better educated, they understand the chemicals that we use. Japanese retailers have to display the chemicals that have been used on the product at the point of sale. Um, and in Australia we couldn't even consider, we wouldn't even think that would, we'd have consumers who would be so, who would understand, um, uh, you know, all of those inputs that well, that that would matter. Uh, there'd just be a level of trust. Uh, the Japanese consumer, there is a level of trust, but they also, they want to know. They're, they're, they're educated in that space. They take it far more seriously than in other markets. Um, and it, in some other ways, it becomes a barrier to entry because the, the standards you have to meet to supply that market become so great that if other people can't supply that, um, it creates a competitive advantage for you. Um, but that's the consumer driving that. So again, that's about... Uh, addressing the consumer need. So four or five years ago when uh, we were being told that we would now, um, the MRL levels that were being met would be displayed on the shelf and that if we exceeded those that would result in a product recall, you know, our first thought was, well, we don't want that. You know, we, we don't need that. We don't need, we, we don't want to go down that path because um, product recalls are very expensive and um, that is something that's of great concern 
and the particularly in the Japanese culture around the um, the loss of face, if that was to occur. Um, after thinking about it for a while, we realised that it's really we have to, uh, I guess respond to the consumer need, which is the consumer, as I said before, wants to understand the product more intimately around the, uh, uh, the core inputs that are in, in that product, as well as um, their desire to have a higher bricks content fruit, and they're willing to pay the, pay the price for it. Um, so that, that's been a clear differentiator, I guess, around uh, Australian consumer, where the consumer sees Australian product as sweeter, more reliable, more consistent, uh, product in the market and has been able to block. Uh, three years ago, Australia was about 45% of the market, so as I said before, about two-thirds now. So um, that growth has been at the expense of the, the, the other Southern Hemisphere countries. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, volume and market presence. From our point of view, we have to support it with critical mass. We can't be in and out of the market all the time, and if we're in that market and we want to occupy shelf space in the dominant retail um, working with those retailers who, who command very high market share in that market, um, we have to support those programs. There's a, there's, a th there's a threshold you have to meet to support it that um, if you can't, then they won't necessarily support your program. Um, season extension, um, again, presence, being in the market for more weeks of the year so that uh, Australia is, a, um, is more commonly on the shelf than any other country. Um, we do work with them on social media and in-store support. Again, it tends to be somewhat with, with our brand, but more often around uh, Brand Australia, around uh, how we're um, ensuring that that uh, continual message around Australian product being available. Um, and, it's, and it's worked very successfully for us. The last market I want to talk about is the USA. Um, so the USA for the, for the citrus industry 15, 20 years ago was, was the panacea of all markets. Uh, any product that would meet the USA spec would go to the USA because the grower returns out of that market were far superior to any other market. Um, then Chile came along with very, very large plantings and over time um, progressively eroded the share of Australian um, citrus. So. What did we learn from that though? That Australia had created a very good brand and product created a very good brand around the quality of Australian citrus and it was generally regarded as the next best thing to, to Californian citrus uh, and obviously being counter seasonal and the eating quality was far superior to any of the other southern hemisphere um, suppliers. So it was an established market with years of trade um, to build on um, but we had to leverage off a solid foundation. As an industry we went from circa 1.6, 1.8 million cartons uh, down to about 300,000 over 10 years. Um, and just about, just about lost that market completely. Um, and now the industry is back to sort of about 40% of where it was in its heyday. And what's constraining that at the moment is not um, the demand, but the uh, competitive um, market situation we have with Northern Asian markets, um, uh, the growth out of China and, and Korea uh, particularly. Um, it is our most competitive market that we against Chile, uh, South Africa and Peru and um, much like other speakers today and uh, as Ryan was saying before, you have to learn from that. So we will often uh, find that is, it, it's a market that is more challenging around compliance. It's a market that um, has less tolerance um, but it is also a great market for, for learning um, uh, for our business. But one of the things that uh, we, we were aligned and supplying many years ago the mainstream retailers um, and then we determined that really that was not the ideal position for our product because they were very much in the price value equation with consumers. Um, they had dominant positions in the market that they weren't prepared to concede um, and at the end of the day they were going to always retail a high quality product uh, but the price um, element of that value proposition for them was a more um, defining than um, other elements. So we had to go and find retailers who we believed were going to put more emphasis on the point of difference Australian citrus provided uh, against the other southern hemisphere suppliers. Um, so our retail uh, relationships have pretty much completely changed um, over the last five or six uh, years and we now find ourselves uh, working with that second tier or even third tier retailer who the relationship is often more intimate, they want to know more about your product, they have a great desire to um, tell the story 
and they are looking for a point of difference and their, more, their, their customers and their market research shows them that their customers have um, uh, the ability to pay more uh, for a higher quality product and want to pay more. So that segmentation within the market is very much the, um, um, the experience we're seeing within the US market. Um, so I think that's the, that was pretty much the end anyway, David, uh, where I wanted to cover and I thought that's a, probably a good point to finish off um, as we go into some Q&A. Great, thank you.